Hey everyone, Eric Grenier here, and welcome to the 109th episode of the RIT Podcast. The election in Manitoba is officially underway, and it could be a very close one between Heather Stephenson's Progressive Conservatives and Wild Canoe's New Democrats, and the Liberals under Dougal Lamont could end up holding the balance of power. So to discuss how the opening days of this campaign have unfolded, I'm joined by Curtis Brown, principal at the Winnipeg-based polling firm Probe Research, Ian Fraze, the CBC's Provincial Affairs Reporter in Manitoba, and Kelly Saunders, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at Brandon University. So thanks to all three of you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Great, thank you. Good to be here. So uh, we'll, we'll go through maybe each of the party's campaigns and how things have started. Uh, Ian, I know you've been there on the ground following the leaders and all this, so maybe you can just give us a, a little bit of an indication of what's been the approach, what's you, what you've seen from the PC campaign since it kicked off? Yeah, let's start with the PCs. It has been very focused on, on affordability. That's sort of been their, their topic of, of the day virtually every day. Um, you know, they, they were, they are, they're promising to cut the lowest income tax bracket in half. Uh, they would defer tax, uh, property taxes for seniors when they're about to sell their home. Um, all, all these tax cuts that you sort, you sort of add them together right now, and it's about a billion dollars once fully implemented for businesses that get rid of the payroll tax completely within eight years. All these things together, that's a, more than a billion dollars once fully implemented. There is a feeling among the Tory camp that, hey, this is an, an issue of affordability that a lot of people care about and that this is something that they can are, are really a winners in and, can, and will have the upper hand over their competition. Kelly, what has been your uh, observation of maybe the, the strategy, the messaging, sort of the approach of the PCs uh, since uh, the writ dropped? Mm -hmm. Well, I think Ian is absolutely right. Obviously, their internal polling or their, what they're hearing is that it's all about the economy. It's all about affordability. It's all about reducing taxes. And so they've literally had a message a day on, on those things. In fact, I heard, the pre I heard an announcement that the Premier was going to be making an announcement about taxes in the economy. And I thought, wow, like, oh, here we go. Here's another day, another announcement on that. So it's very clear they're staking all of their ground on that one issue. Uh, Curtis, since uh, you, know, you follow the numbers at, at Probe, you know, the, the PCs have been uh, in some trouble. Some of the recent... You know, voting intentions polling has been a bit better, but Heather Stephenson's approval ratings are still really low. So yeah. what do you think their strategy is here? Like, what is the approach that they're taking that they think that they, they have to take in order to try to win this? Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with everyone else about what, um, you know, what they're trying to do. And I think the other sort of point, I think, to keep in mind is that, you know, for the Conservatives, this is a very defensive campaign. Um, they won a lot of seats in the last two elections. This is all about trying to hold the NDP off, especially uh, seats in and around Winnipeg. And I think um, what they're trying to do by focusing so much on affordability and tax cuts and all those sorts of things is really try to appeal to a certain uh, kind of voter uh, who lives in either suburban Winnipeg or maybe some of these uh, other bedroom communities in the capital region like Selkirk or Dawson Trail, some of these places that they you know need to keep. Um, and really it's just sort of very micro-targeted on, on, you know, folks that are going to be concerned about that and react to that about how they can, um, uh, you know, be able to get, you know, get more money back in terms of various kinds of tax cuts. And I think that's really kind of what we're seeing so far. They might pivot to something else, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that leading up to the campaign, they've made a lot of the big spending promises and that I think kind of helped them get back a little bit um, in our tracking surveys, which they were behind uh, for, for the better part of two years. Um, but yeah, now they're kind of at a point where I think they're really trying to move a particular kind of voter just in certain areas. They're not really, you know, necessarily trying to appeal to everyone, um, but it's really kind of about some of those suburban, exurban uh, areas and those seats that they just need to keep to be able to win a majority. Ian, uh, observing this from, from Ottawa, I'm always curious about what role, uh, you know, federal politics plays in this. Uh, we have seen that Justin Trudeau has been a bit of a punching bag in some other provincial campaigns. Uh, is Heather Stevenson taking the same approach when it comes to this uh, election campaign in Manitoba? She's starting to. For about two years as premier, she's, you know, unlike in Alberta or Saskatchewan, you know, the other prairie provinces where, you know, attacking Trudeau is, is always going to get you votes. It's less so in a more centrist province like Manitoba. So as Stephenson has tried to take over from Palliser, she's tried to play a little more centrist. You know, she started to spend money. And, you know, she's abandoned pledges like, you know, fighting um, Ottawa in court over the carbon tax. But it, just in August here, we saw the, the Tories sort of 
maybe push themselves a little to the right and actually sort of renew the carbon tax attack, saying that we would fight Ottawa on getting, you know, no, no more carbon tax on Manitoba Hydro, since it is a, you know, Manitoba Hydro is, for the most part, clean hydroelectricity. But the thing is, there's no carbon tax actually on, you know, the hydroelectricity, it's on natural gas. So she is saying that, you know, if reelected, the Tories would, within 10 days, I believe, you know, get rid of that and, and probably, you know, without Ottawa's permission, just stop charging it and you know, undoubtedly a fight would occur there. Uh, so again, I feel like, you know, as Curtis is saying, there's, they're not going for everybody here. They just need sort of swing voters in certain ridings and, you know, latching on to this anti-Trudeau uh, contingent might be a, a play to get some of those votes. Kelly, do you, do you find that uh, th- this is a, a departure from the Pallister years? Has Stephenson taken a different approach than than was the case, or is this the continuation of, you know, a government that's now in its uh, seventh year? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, certainly in, in terms of fighting Ottawa, Ian's right, you know, you see a, a, a renewed focus on that. Obviously, they think that plays well, either to the specific slices of voters they're going after or their own base. Um, in fact, I'm thinking about the billboards that I've seen around Winnipeg, where they have a Wab Kanu, the leader of the NDP, uh, an image of uh, Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau, sort of like the three, you know, um, horsemen of the apocalypse, so to speak, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, what the future might hold if you elect an NDP government. So you do see, I think, an attempt to kind of circle back to some of that punching on Ottawa, which is interesting because we've had record level transfer payments, uh, equalization payments have been incredibly strong. So, you know, Ottawa has been generous to Manitoba over the last few years. So it, it's kind of interesting that you see that happening. Uh, but, you know, your larger question about is she taking a different tack? I think yes and no. Uh, she certainly in the beginning tried to present herself as being more conciliatory, more agreeable, uh, more consensus oriented rather than Pallister's really irascible fists up all the time kind of uh, approach to uh, government But I think over the last little while, she's trying to now present more of a tougher image. So, you know, she's drawing the line when it comes to civil servants that are striking or, you know, union issues, uh, labor issues in the province. So it's a little bit of a schizophrenic kind of uh, approach she's taking. I'm not quite sure how her handlers are trying to portray her and and, uh, not quite sure if if that's working. Curtis, has uh, Heather Stevenson some some vulnerabilities that they have to address over the next few, few weeks, uh, because it's not a lot of time. She's been premier for a little while now, but her numbers have been, haven't been really improving that much. Um, are there things that they need to do over the next few weeks to try to close the deal? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess some of it will depend a little bit on how she performs in the debates uh, vis-a-vis Wab Canoe. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, at this point, um, how people feel about Heather Stephenson is, is pretty baked in. Um, you know, we have seen you know, she has had a little bit of a bounce, I think, in the Angus Reid um, numbers that came out this past week. Uh, but she's still right down at the bottom. And I think, you know, a lot of Manitobans really have kind of already passed judgment on her and how they feel about her. And, and But, I mean, it was no different with Brian Pallister. I mean, Brian Pallister was usually much less popular than the party uh, the party itself. Um, it's just, a, you know, in a baby in a bit of a, a, bit of a different way. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that is also, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. And I think Kelly, you know, Kelly's use of the word schizophrenic is, uh, you know, probably, probably good because I think in some ways, yeah, there is kind of this way of trying to like, you know, sort of appear, appeal, the, um, uh, you know, sort of appear that they're fighting, you know, fighting a little bit. Stand, you know, I mean, their slogan is, you know, fighting for this, fighting for that. I mean, that's really their main message in the campaign. You see that all over their campaign sides. Um, but it is also like, um, you know, it's a little hard to square in, in some ways, uh, you know, having this kind of, um, you know, person, you know, as the premier who's, you know, uh, you know, comes from a pretty wealthy background, has been involved in politics, you know, for, you know, most of her career. Um, but, you know, kind of can't go so far as maybe, you know, sort of like a Doug Ford or a Danielle Smith or someone like that in terms of really appealing, appearing super, super populist. And it seems like they're kind of trying to position her as much as they can kind of in that camp without it being totally phony and inauthentic. And so there's a little bit of a, yeah, there's a little bit of a disconnect there in terms of how they, how they position her and how they do that. And I just, I don't think at this point, Manitoba's opinions of Heather Stephenson are really going to change all that much. I think they kind of, they, they, they know what they're getting and they, they have the view of her and it's really just about whether they can move, you know, enough people in, in those particular places to, to be able to, to, to stick with the PCs on election day. 
Uh, we'll move over to the uh, the NDP. Wab Canoe is in a second campaign, so you know some views are already um, even longer baked in, I guess, for for Wab Canoe's leadership of the New Democrats. Ian, how has their campaign been going so far? What what's been their focus? I guess in in some ways their campaign started in in August, really a month before, and, and they were coming out virtually every day with announcements. Um, you know, they shifted a little bit to the right. Uh, in terms of, you know, following the lead of Alberta and Ontario and getting rid of the gas tax for a certain, you know, conservative premiers and following their lead. Uh, you know, he's portrayed himself as tough on crime. You know, a lot of folks are aware of his sh- troubled past and some of their P- Manitoban's opinions are baked in on that. But he says, you know, it's because of that background that I know the benefit of being tough on crime. So he's tried to portray himself in, in that way. Once the campaign has gotten started, here in September, it has been virtually healthcare every single day. PCs just on affordability, NDP really going hard on healthcare. They're promising, you know, three ERs, uh, five minor illness and injury clinics, five neighborhood, uh, you know, team-based clinics as well. It's healthcare all the time. Uh, the challenge there, of course, is that uh, healthcare, as we know throughout the country, is a hard thing to fix, and the NDP is putting a lot of faith in that. Kelly, what's been your uh, your thoughts on the first uh, little, you know, few weeks of the NDP's campaign? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought the NDP really came out of the gate quite hard and quite uh, strong. Um, it seemed it was kind of like, you know, they, they clearly saw themselves as the front runner and they were going to be very proactive in that. Whereas the, uh, you know, some uh, some newspaper columnists were like, you know, it's time to wake up progressive conservatives. Like it's, you know, they, they were just kind of MIA for, I think, the last the first little bit. Uh, now, obviously, we're, we're in full on election mode. So things have evened out a little bit. But Ian's right. It's um, clearly they see that the issue is all about health care and so they've had very comprehensive um, you know literally announcement a day something related to health care so they feel that that is going to be the issue uh, that's going to uh, take them over the line and and it's also interesting too I think uh, and maybe we'll talk about this more a little bit more uh, but the ways in which Wab Canoe has dealt with tried to neutralize the crime issue as Ian mentioned uh, that was something the conservatives were really trying to paint him with um, maybe tapping into not only his his background but also fears we have over the fact that crime has been rising uh, in the province manitobans are more fearful than ever about issues related to crime and so trying to i think stoke some fears uh, that if you elect the ndp and this premier in particular wab canoe uh, that crime will only increase and so he just rather than trying to dodge and deflect that issue he just waited right into the middle of that and said yeah i'm owning this this is who i am this is my background but this is how I'm going to leverage my experiences into really understanding and hopefully ameliorating this problem uh, that we're all dealing with. So I thought that was quite an interesting way of, you know, it's uh, it's a gamble, right? But it was quite an interesting way, I think, to try to neutralize that framing that the Tories were trying to paint of him and his party. Curtis, what are your views on, on the issue set and how the NDP and Wapkanu fits into them? Yeah, I, I think it's not surprising that they've focused as much on health care. I mean, the fact that they've really, I mean, the, they've done announced a lot of things about health care, like Ian said, you know, but the one in particular that, you know, I think really stands out is the fact that they've said that they would reopen three emergency departments that were are all in suburban Winnipeg, uh, two, you know, two of them in areas that um, they're really gunning to win seats back, um, you know, and, and areas that, you know, historically had voted NDP or had been more likely to lean NDP when they were in government. Um, you know, that promise in particular, I think, is you know, really important in terms of trying to be able to win over um, suburb, you know, some of those suburban voters in those areas. Uh, and I think beyond that, yeah, I mean, to, to Kelly's point, I think what, um, what they've also tried to do by really addressing the crime issue and the Wab Canoes past issue, you know, right out of the gate. I mean, the, the Conservatives, uh, you know, spent a lot of, uh, you know, on uh, bus benches. They have a candidate who is a former uh, Winnipeg City police officer who, you know, this message that, you know, crime's only going to get worse. And, you know, I think they've really kind of tried to, you know, address that as much as they can. But even also just, yeah, I think I think Wab Canoe is also really, they've tried to position Wab Canoe as someone who, you know, it could be the premier, is a premier. I mean, every announcement he's, you know, wearing a suit and he's very like, uh, you know, sort of, you know, sort of looking sort of like, you know, what one imagines a premier, a premier might be. Uh, and on, and on top of that, I think the other thing is, yeah, like also the issue of, of endorsements. I mean, very, you know, right when the campaign kind of got officially underway, Lloyd Axworthy, a former, you know, federal liberal cabinet minister and, uh, uh, you know, former president of the University of Winnipeg came out and, you know, kind of gave 
blob is blessing in some ways, and I think which I think for the NDP was a signal to liberal voters or people who tend to vote liberal, um, you know, you should vote for Wab Canoe and the NDP, and that's something where the NDP is always, you know, when they've been successful in Manitoba, they need liberal voters to come into the fold. So that was one thing. This week, um, I mean, it's not really, you know, hugely surprising that a former NDP premier would kind of be on board, but Gary Dewar was brought out and, uh, you know, to talk about how he would be a trade advisor um, to a future NDP government. Um, and Gary Dewar, since kind of retiring from active politics and being an ambassador, has kind of stayed out of the fray uh, for the NDP. So having him kind of come back, I mean, he's someone who, um, you know, a lot, you know, was a very, very popular premier, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and that's something I think for a lot of people who maybe were past NDP voters who've gone elsewhere. I mean, that's also, I think, a signal that, okay, you know, this is, this is someone we should vote for and this is someone that we should consider, uh, you know, who, you know, should be the next premier of the province. And so I think, you know, kind of all those things, I mean, the NDP has been pretty successful so far, I think, in that regard. And, um, you know, I'm curious to see kind of how the conservatives try to respond to that or deal with that, you know, whether they're saving some, you know, potential attacks or some of that sort of thing for the last, uh, last couple of weeks of the campaign. Uh, in uh, you know Gary Dewar is is pretty much the model of the pragma pragmatic kind of centrist NDP. Um, you know, New Democrats, at least elsewhere in the country, and especially at the federal level, can sometimes bristle at um, taking centrist positions rather than being on the left. Uh, you know, I, I've heard uh, Dugald Lamont, leader of the Liberals, more or less say that the NDP is coming out with PC policies and this kind of thing. How do new Democrats feel about this campaign? Do they feel confident? Do they feel like they're making compromises? Uh, is there any tension there within the NDP camp? I, I, I think all of those things. Um, you know, there's unease that they've taken some more progressive policies or some more rather uh, maybe right-leaning policies, you know, again, getting rid of that gas tax for a, a certain amount of time, which has angered, you know, some of the environmental crowd. Um you know, they railed for months about these education property tax rebates that the PCs have done. You know, people get half their property education property taxes back now by the form of a check. That the PC or the NDP is are going to are going to keep that at least for now. They are taking. You know, they they tried to neutralize sort of the the you know some of the attacks that the Tories would would get at them by saying that they would follow the fiscal framework of the PC budget that passed you know six months ago. But that's not really, you know, some of the progressive factions of the party wouldn't be totally thrilled with that. Yet, you know, going historically, you know, to, to be a Gary Dewar, which is, you know, what, 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 what Wap Canoe would like to be, they do need to take some more centrist positions. So there's also an understanding that, you know, the party needs to make some of these steps, try to be more centrist, to, you know, to get some of those votes that, that they desperately need. Kelly, the, the, the map for the New Democrats, you know, it, it does mean going into the suburbs, which might mean having a bit more of a centrist uh, position, but also trying to win some seats outside of Winnipeg, including in Brandon, where there is a seat that they're looking uh, to pick up there. So uh, how do you think that is going to play in some of these some of these areas where it's swing voters? It's not necessarily, you know, the NDP progressive kind of traditional left wing voter that we might we might associate with the New Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Brandon, and, and uh, for sure, Brandon East is, uh, there's three seats uh, in uh, in Brandon, which is the second largest city in Manitoba. Uh, there's Brandon East, Brandon West, and then uh, another riding called Spruce Woods, which kind of takes in a northern part of the city and kind of circles the city as well. So uh, the other two seats, Spruce Woods and Brandon West, um, I think uh, have been fairly, certainly w Spruce Woods has been solidly conservative. Brandon West has tended to lean more progressive conservative as well but Brandon East is where I think the fight is really going to be and that is traditionally an NDP riding and so I think that the certainly the NDP see that is a winnable seat for them certainly I think the demographics suggest that uh, they've got a good shot at winning it back and uh, Wab Canoe the leader has been to Brandon three or four times now uh, already um, you know uh, campaigning in, in Brandon East so I think that Certainly, they see that as is a winnable seat, and they're going to have to, you know, if they if they want to carve out that path to victory. It's not just focusing on those urban seats in Winnipeg, which are critical for sure, but trying to pick up what they can out here. So, looking at ridings like Dauphin, for example, and certainly Brandon East, and and in terms of you know, as a shift a little bit more to the center, um, hurting the party, I'm not really hearing that out here. Uh, what I am hearing, though, is some conservatives that are saying little bit uncomfortable with maybe some of the more right-wing shifts 
that they see happening in their party. Uh, the PC party here has prided itself historically on being a progressive conservative party, more of a centrist political party compared to some other prairie provinces. And so we've certainly seen that shift a little bit to the right under Brian Pallister and continuing under Heather Stephenson. So issues related to so-called parental rights uh, policies, for example, um, that we see playing out in New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, uh, is, is part of the PC platform here. And, and I'm picking up a little bit of discomfort with longtime conservatives on that. So we'll see how that plays out here. And there isn't really much pressure on the right from them. The Keystone Party only has five candidates, so it's not really that they're taking a lot of that vote away. Um, mm -hmm. Curtis, how do you see the kind of the electoral map right now, particularly with the NDP's kind of path, what, what they're looking to gain, but also what the PCs are hoping to hold? Yeah, I agree. Like I said, I think it's for the PCs, it's purely defensive and it's about trying to keep, you know, the seats that they can. And yeah, I mean, I mentioned the there's the suburban, you know, kind of ring in Winnipeg. I mean, there's ones in uh, you know, a few seats in South Winnipeg. Um, you know, you, you profiled this week uh, Fort Richmond, which is, I think, uh, one of the prime ones uh, to keep an eye on. But there'd also be seats like St. River, Waverly in that part of the city. There's a couple seats in Southeast, or sorry, Northeast Winnipeg, pardon me. Uh, Radisson and Rossmuir, I think, where the NDP is trying to pick up. And then McPhillips is one in, in the northwest part of the city um, where I think, yeah, the, the NDP is really kind of trying to uh, pick up seats as well. And a couple, uh, maybe either, you know, the far west part of the city, like Kirkville Park and Assiniboia might be in play as well. Um, but that only takes you, that only takes you so far. And as Kelly says, I mean, the NDP can't just, you know, win government purely based on winning seats, um, in Winnipeg, you know, they have to win, you know, they, they should, you know, be able to win, have to win seats like Brandon East and Dauphin, certainly in Western Manitoba. Uh, and then uh, Selkirk would be one, certainly. I mean, Selkirk is kind of a interesting, it's like the city of Selkirk, but also kind of a bedroom community area north of Winnipeg and a little bit rural. Um, that's one that I think would also be kind of high up on their list. Uh, Dawson Trail, which is also a lot of um, sort of exurban bedroom communities east of Winnipeg. Um, it's one that uh, it's interesting. I think this is, uh, you know, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the liberals aren't running a full slate. And there's a couple of seats where um, uh, there, there isn't going to be a liberal candidate. Selkirk's won, Dauphin won, and Dawson Trail's actually won as well. The Conservatives won that pretty handily last time, but the Liberals actually finished ahead of the NDP. Uh, they had over 20% of the vote in that in that riding, and now without no, without a liberal candidate, the question is going to be what happens with those voters? They just mostly go to the NDP, which is kind of, I guess, a little bit of the conventional wisdom that, uh, that might happen, or uh, do they stay home? Do some of them vote PC? What happens? So... Um, that's when I think the NDP would also, you know, if things go really well for, for the party on, on election night, they, you know, they potentially be wanting to pick up as well. Yeah, and there's no green candidates in most ridings. There's only 13. Last time they had 43. So there's a lot of that vote that's been liberated. And as you mentioned, the Liberals, uh, we'll talk about them. We'll go around, uh, around the horn on them once. Uh, you know, they're running a slate of 49 candidates. So there's not a full slate, which is a bit surprising. The, you know, they are a party that has been able to run a full slate. Ian... Uh, how prepared are the Liberals for this campaign, and why don't they have a full slate of candidates? Uh, it was interesting to hear, uh, you know, Dougal Lamont, the, the provincial Liberal leader, it, it acknowledge that there's just a lot of anger around the Liberal brand, and and suggesting that that played a role in how, uh, you know, they haven't been able to get some seats, you know, again, particularly, you know, both that ten or so, largely in in, in rural Manitoba. Um, it's, it's an interesting time for the Liberals because considering how tight this race could be, they could indeed hold the balance of power. So you'd think they might be able to get more support. But but as we've seen in, in the last few years with some of the, the polling out of probe, you know, they've kind of stayed in that single digits in popularity. And while there's been a lot of anger around the Tories, a lot of that's gone to the NDP and the Liberals have, have yet to capitalize. And to some degree, they've got three seats now, one shy of official party status. They are also having to play defensive a little bit. The NDP is making a big run for St. Boniface, uh, where, which is Lamont's seat. Uh, they, the NDP had, 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 had held that seat before. And then maybe even to a lesser extent, uh, River Heights, the, the NDP has been you know, knocking on doors for a year and a half there, and they feel a momentum there that, that they can steal. So um, you know, depending on how things shake out, they could still play a big role, yet they have yet been... They have not been able to really capitalize on, on the PC anger. 
Uh, Kelly, what role do you think the, the Liberals are going to play in this? And also, what role could they play afterwards? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, I've heard Lamont say that he's, he's not going to tie himself to one of these parties, but presumably one of them is more likely partner than the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in, and I think just logically, it probably would be the NDP, especially given how centrist or maybe shifting a little bit more towards the right, uh, which is what we've seen the NDP doing. I think that would be more of a natural um, alliance uh, than, uh, than, than the Liberals and, and the, and the uh, Conservatives, if we are talking about a minority situation. Yeah, I mean, Ian's right. It's, it's a weird kind of situation for them because no one's really paying a lot of attention to them. They, they're struggling. Uh, as they have been for a number of years now just to find volunteers and supporters and most importantly fundraising dollars which has really limited their ability to get their messaging out they haven't had official party status in the Manitoba legislature which is four seats for a few years now so that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy right you don't have party status you don't have resources but you can't get resources and party status if you know if you don't have enough people so it, it they, they, they've caught uh, they've been caught in this and en- this endless circle I think of just really, you know, struggling on on a number of fronts. And there's also been some internal party disunity over the last few years, um, you know, a series of different leaders. So all of that combined is, I think, really weakened them. And yet here we are on the on the cusp of a potential um, situation where they could be, you know, playing a rainmaker in a minority situation. So, but really not having, I don't think, the organizational capacity to really be able to steer that through. So um, that's one of the scenarios. We're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. But yeah. Curtis, uh, what do you think the prospects are for the Liberals in this one? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I mean, depending on how things shake out, they could be in a kingmaker situation, right? Um, I mean, it's a lot of things have to happen to kind of end up in that situation where you have a minority uh, minority government in Manitoba. We haven't had one of those in a long time, uh, and certainly not one where it's just like, a, you know, it would potentially just be a few um, seats for a party kind of holding, you know, as the way of holding the balance of power, whichever way it goes. Um, it's a possibility, but yeah, I think I think the Liberals. Um, I mean, the Liberals have a stronger brand in Manitoba, and they have had a stronger brand in Manitoba than they have, say, in like Saskatchewan or Alberta. Um, you know, certainly, you know, they're they're able to, you know, have been able to win at least, you know, one to three seats for the last number of elections. Um, but yeah, it's, like Ian said, it's going to be challenging. I mean, St. Boniface is one. The NDP certainly is going to make a push to win. Burroughs is one that uh, has voted NDP before, and sort of naturally is a. Um, you know, would sort of be considered like a fairly safe NDP seat under other circumstances. Um, uh, Kevin, you know, a federal MP Kevin Lamoureux's daughter Cindy is the MLA for that seat. And I mean, the, the Lamoureux's, you know, always seem to be able to, to get elected in Manitoba. Um, you know, one of my one of my rules is never never bet against them um, because it's uh, yeah, they just seem to be able to, you know, always be able to get elected federally or provincially kind of in, in NDP leaning uh, areas. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's 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 difficult, and it's hard to see kind of where the liberals kind of go beyond that. And I mean, they could find themselves in a fortunate situation. But like I said before, the NDP also, I think, a big part of their strategy is to try to knock the liberal vote down as much as they can and say, um, liberals, you know, we need you to vote for the NDP. Um, and that's always something that they've been able to do successfully when they've won majority governments. And it's when liberal vote has crept up. I mean, not to the point where. Um, You know, it's potentially the Liberals are going to be winning a whole bunch of seats, but um, the Conservatives have always kind of relied to some extent on the Liberals being able to be in that 15 to 20 percent range uh, when they do really well. And so, yeah, I guess we'll kind of see what happens as far as, um, you know, where where they end up being. But, yeah, they're not they're not kind of in a they're not they're not in a great spot and they're always kind of in a challenging, challenging spot just because of, uh, you know, just because of the nature of the party and the nature of the dynamics in, in Manitoba. Uh, we'll uh, finish on this, and, and Curtis, I'll stick with you for this one. Next few weeks, what, what's going to be the most important thing for you to, uh, to keep an eye on? Well, I think I think the debates, you know, may have some effect on how people, uh, you know, how people feel about, uh, you know, the different party leaders and see the see, you know, see them up close in terms of the performance. I mean, I think that uh, you know, you look at the recent Alberta election. I think that made a difference in terms of how people felt about, uh, you know, Daniel Smith. It could be the same way with uh, with Heather Stephenson if she has a fairly um, strong performance. I think we know from the last election and just, you know, based on his career that, you know, Watt Canoe, we would expect that he's going to perform fairly well in, in that environment. And I'm also curious to see what happens with the Conservatives and whether they, you know, if there's something else that they can do to try to, 
uh, you know, blunt any kind of positive momentum that the NDP has or to try to knock them off, off their message or off their game to some extent. You know, whether they're focusing on Wab Canoe specifically or they're focusing on, the, you know, the, the caucus and what an NDP government might look like. Or, um, But yeah, those are some of the things I think that I'm going to be watching for. I don't know if the issue set is really going to change that much, but I think just kind of the dynamics of the campaign, those are the two things that I'm going to be keeping an eye on. Ian, uh, you're going to be there with the leaders, uh, you know, following people around. Uh, what are you going to be keeping an eye on? I, I do wonder if, you know, if, if the PC or NDP, if they s sort of shift. I know Curtis says, you know, and it's probably fair that they, they may not shift too much, but, you know, does the NDP feel like they need to bring more affordability matters to the table uh, because the PCs have gone at that for, for a week and a half, you know, every single day? And further, does the PCs, you know, we know they're vulnerable on health care, uh, but they've said literally nothing about it besides what they did at, at, in government, you know, do they try to find, you know, a, a way to get at that? You know, we, they were, they've been pretty big on crime. We haven't heard stuff from them on, on that front yet. Um, so I'm interested in seeing really how, how the messaging um, kind of shifts and, and what new policies come, up, come, up, come out there. Kelly, I'll give you the, the last word. What are you going to be looking for? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at for things on two fronts. Number one, on the issues front, like Ian, I'm, I'm curious to see if, 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 it, if, the, uh, if the Tories are going to move away from affordability and tax cuts, and it's kind of like, what else have you got? Like, or if they're going to they're stick to that. And same thing with the NDP. It's been, as we said, healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. Are they going to start pivoting a little bit in some of their messaging? Um, and then on the other front, I'm curious to see how the Conservatives in particular are going to try to reframe Wab Canoe now. Now that the, you know, the frame of he's a scary criminal with a scary past really has been neutralized and blunted, I think. Are they going to try something different as a way to really try to, um, you know, get at him a little bit and try to undermine the momentum that I think the NDP do have? So, so I, I'm curious to see if we're going to see some dirtier politics coming out and maybe some more negative uh, campaigning start to happen, especially as, you know, those numbers really tighten in a lot of those key races. Uh, I'm going to be looking for some polls. I haven't had any yet. <laughs> and I would like some numbers, please. So, Curtis, if Soon. you can get on that. Soon. All right, good, good, good. All right. So uh, I really appreciate this chat. It's, it's an interesting campaign. There's still some miles to go before we get to voting day. So I appreciate the three of you joining me and uh, chatting about this, this election. And we'll see where it ends up on, uh, on October 3rd. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.